Uh, Jamie, so good to see you. This is a huge effort you have. You and almost 30 other CEOs are partnering with the Department of Education to create almost 100,000 jobs. Why are you doing this? Yeah. How are you doing it? Yeah. It is a huge effort. And the important part, as you're right, is it's CEOs coming together to try to tackle one of society's big problems, which is getting inner city school education, largely minority, that getting these kids through school and with a high paying job. It's been done before, but it's never been done like this. And we're hoping we can you know, bend the curve here. We're working with CUNY, that's the first thing we're announcing, but that hopefully that's the first of many steps, but very specific objectives. Why do you need to do it? In theory, this should have solved for itself, right? Think about the Bronx, where you've got 85% higher unemployment than you had in Manhattan. Right. And before COVID, we know that here there was over a million open jobs. Why wouldn't education move to meet the demand and create jobs? Why wouldn't education yeah. move to offer the skills for the jobs of tomorrow? Yeah. That's a great question, and in some parts of this world, they've done a really good job at answering that question, like in Germany, Switzerland, some of the lessons we've all learned, and certain parts of the United States. Uh, but the really important thing is a lot of businesses don't have to worry about what goes on in the South Bronx. And so they can just kind of literally and figuratively drive by because they can hire elsewhere and other things. This is a recognition that that's also our problem. Society is worse off if we don't give the kids opportunity, give them jobs. It's not a zero-sum game. The extent you can lift up people, and of course now you have COVID, and you know the murder of George Floyd, which have you know identified didn't identify, they kind of uh, made it obvious that we already had the, these flaws existed before COVID and George Floyd, and we need to fix them. And I I personally don't think you're going to fix it just government alone. I think you need business. You know, 80 percent of the jobs are in business. Business has AI. We know what we need. We know how we need it. In effect, we can help train the trainers, but you have to do it with government. You have to do it with the educators. You can't do it separately. So, you know, we are thrilled that uh, Thalo, from, uh, who's running CUNY, wants to be part of this. So somehow, working together, we think we can accomplish some great things. And it helps create jobs, you know, good, good paying jobs for the kids and jobs that we need to get filled. Did you need to do this? Do you view this as philanthropy or is it a business initiative? It's a business initiative. I, first of all, this is my own personal view, okay, is that we have to fix some of society's big problems. And you all know what they are, it's infrastructure. We haven't done a good job of that. Inner city school education, we haven't done a good job of that. Healthcare, and even the well-being of our citizens. You know, Ray Ordiano told me that 70% of the kids who apply to the military, 70% can't get in because they're either unhealthy, obese, or they can't read or write. I mean, we can't have a healthy society that way. And I also personally believe, had we fixed all these problems, we'd be growing 1% faster. It's right, it's just, It'd be good for growth. It would, it would help everyone. And so I think it's good. It's important for business to help tackle these problems and not ignore them. But is business tackling these problems because government failed in terms of policy and didn't do their job? It, it possibly, but that's trying to point fingers who's to blame. My point is I don't care who's to blame. I want to get those kids, whether it's out of high schools or community college or college, so that when they get out, they say, my God, I've got a job that's well paying. You know, I don't know if you know it, there's a school right down here called Aviation High School in Long Island City. You know, kids travel two or three hours a day to get in and out. It's a high school. They teach you basic high school stuff. They also teach you how to maintain small aircraft, like a Cessna. And they teach you hydraulics and electrical and mechanical and stuff like that. 95 plus percent of those kids get out earning $60,000 a year. I mean, that's what you want. They're part of society. Jobs create dignity. Usually that first job is the first rung in the, uh, on the ladder. You start to move up. So if you can get society working, it'd be better for everybody. And, you know, of course, there'll be consumers. They'll be happier. It'll be good, better for social outcomes. Jobs are dignity and jobs are growth. Then why didn't this happen before? When I look at this program and I see, wow, you're going to create internships and apprenticeships. Traditionally, internships go to kids who go to the very best schools, who are the most connected. And oftentimes, internships don't pay anything. Yeah. Well, we pay for interns, by the way. I think it's wrong for big companies not to pay for interns. But, you know, half these kids that we have come apprenticeships and internships, you know what they, what they say and when it's over? I didn't know it was fun. I didn't know I could get paid for it. I didn't know the opportunities existed. They didn't know what coding was. They didn't know that, you know, we, have, we do laugh at, at work. We make it fun for people. And so it's just important that people get involved in society. And they don't, they don't drive by these big towers and say, those places, that's not me. I'll never have a job there because they can. 
and they could start as a teller, they could start in coding, they could start in any which way. And so uh, many, many years ago, you've asked this question twice, schools were set up to teach you reading and writing, and that's what you needed to have a job. And even if you weren't good at reading and writing, if you can work hard with your hands and become a laborer, you would earn a well-paying job at a factory or General Motors, something like that. The world got much more complicated. The jobs now need additional math, additional reading, certain science. They're doable. You know, even to become a teller, J.P. Morgan, you know, which pays $35,000 a year with medical for an 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid, that first job, you know, you have to learn a lot of stuff, a lot of systems, a lot of feedback, a lot of math. And so the training, you need training to do that. So I think just the world changed. We didn't really keep up with it, and we're trying to go back and fix it. A lot of companies are doing great individual things, but they're, they're isolated. This, we're hoping, that is a force multiplier, that it's an exponential that if you find those jobs that work, you have this exponential growth, uh, how we do coding or something like that. So uh, we're quite hopeful that this could actually make a big difference. This program is about creating long-term solutions. Yeah. But the truth is, since COVID, we're in a real-world immediate crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned it before. It has exposed <clears throat> and exacerbated inequalities in healthcare, housing, income, education. What's the most important thing we need to address right now? Yeah. So I would separate this from that. So had we been doing this before, it would have reduced a lot of what you said. So just like we run J.P. Morgan, we're doing a lot of things now that we need to do that don't relate to COVID. They're the right thing to do for the long-term health of the country, our company, our clients, and stuff like that. But, there are, but obviously, we're doing everything we can to help right now. So think of financing small businesses, financing large companies, you know, helping communities as best we can, you know, both in funding, with philanthropy, with uh, in any way we can, we're trying to help right now, but that shouldn't stop us from doing the right long-term thing. Philanthropy yeah. is a drop in the bucket. Business can only do so much. Yeah. You do influence government. From a government perspective, when you look at the economic impact and the pain people are feeling, what do we need to happen most right now from right. our government? What do they need to focus so, okay, on? So can I just separate the long-term? Because we, we always focus too much in the short run. COVID is a problem, we will get through it. How? Okay, well, I'm gonna get through it in a second. It's a problem, we'll get through it. America is very resilient, but we have to fix infrastructure. We have to fix immigration. We have to fix education. We have to fix health care. Those things are actually extremely damaging, and we have to acknowledge it. And more to the f poorer folks here, minorities, you know, not, not to me. And so to me, we should attack those problems. But COVID itself, you know, I, I think the government took bold, dramatic action. And I'm going to give credit to Stephen Mnuchin, Jay Powell, the administration, and the Democrats and Republican Congress. Who would have thought they could move that quick? You know, PPP, and you can argue with PPP, and, and it's been redesigned a couple of times, but they move very quickly, probably save 30, 35 million jobs. You know, though we're not through this thing yet. You know, I think a lot of the Fed programs and the markets had virtually closed down. They opened up the markets. You know, companies are issuing debt, they're issuing equity, they're doing M&A. You know, they're getting prepared. They, they have the wherewithal to get through a tougher time now. So they did the right things. And you know, I always go back and say, you know, when you're in the boxing ring, you know, it's very easy to say you should have ducked. You know, but they did the right things. They got that stuff done, and we're going to need more. So uh, the government has got to do a little bit more around, for small, particularly for small business, unemployment insurance, et cetera, to get us through the next three to six months as we open up. We're going to have to open up. It could be done safely and soundly. You've seen it being done in countries around the world. You know, we've made a few mistakes in certain parts of this country, but, but opening up will be okay. You can go back to work safe and sound, and, and so that hopefully the economy will have a chance to recover. There's going to be some scar tissue from this one, but that we have a chance to recover. Right now, do you think we can? You've got 200,000 employees that, do you think you can bring them back to work safely? Because we have millions of kids well, that need to go back to school so you safely. guys came in here today, and there's some people. I think this building is about 10% occupied. The trading floor is about 25%. And remember, we have 4,000 branches open. That's, you know, 40,000 people right there. We've got people who move money and cash and vaults who are working every day. So we have a lot of people at work. But... The, there are a lot, so there's still 150,000 people working from home. And I think while there may be some permanency to some of that, there's a huge value to working together in terms of collaboration and creativity and training the younger people. You and I spoke earlier that we graduated a class of 3,000 interns today. They did not meet in person one J.P. Morgan person. You know, and that, that's, that's not good enough. I mean, we did the great, as best we can for them. So, yeah, we're going to get back to work. Hopefully there'll be a vaccine and hopefully 
you know, people do it really safely. I mean, we're not going to do anything to jeopardize our people. We're given a lot of flexibility, particularly as schools are not opening, and uh, so we have to figure it out, but we'll navigate through it. Should schools reopen? I don't know the answer to that. You I, sound I, right. I have a da daughters with children, and one says X and one says Y. I, it, things have to be done safely, and I just don't know exactly how to go about that, but, uh, but, we're good, but the society has to reopen. We, we can't be doing this a year from now and think that it won't cause devastation in the economy. And by the way, to the health of people. But the, the health effects, the negative health effects of that in terms of depression and drugs, et cetera, could be really bad. No so, doubt. Yeah, so we should be very cautious about how you look at this issue. And you do sound very optimistic. Then what do you say to that single mom in the Bronx who has to go back to work because she's a cashier at a grocery store and she's not part of a training program, but her kids are going to school virtually and they don't have a community center to go to and they don't have a camp because of all this. What do you say to that woman who says, I'm suffering, I'm not getting the extended unemployment anymore? Yeah, I, I'm very sympathetic. And you know, one of the beautiful things that's been happening, because you are in the city and you've probably heard it at seven o'clock every night, people stick their head out the windows and they're clapping and thanking people. And that don't that, pay the rent. No, no but, but it, should, it, it should give us a little civility to thank people all the time and to realize that all these jobs are kind of essential and stuff like that. So if those people need special help, there's unemployment insurance, there's, there's maybe, you know, we're going to try to do some child care stuff for some of our employees. So I'm very sympathetic, and most of the companies I know are trying to help their employees through this, most of them. That, that, they can't all do that, but most of them are trying. Big businesses, but you know, especially because you are so involved in PPP, half this country is employed by small businesses. Yeah. Do you think a year from now we could only have big box stores and chain restaurants? No. How well, are they going to stay in business? Well, I mean, there, there, there are 20 million or some small businesses. A lot of them are one-person shops, but there are a lot of successful ones that are still working, they're selling goods on Amazon. And they're, so, but there are the ones who are really suffering. And so, you know, Howard Schultz at Starbucks is talking about the restaurants, and the restaurants are having a really tough time. Some aren't going to make it. And there may be other retailers. You see, obviously, retailers struggling a little bit. You do see, do see some people doing quite well, like you said, the big boxes and you know, Amazon and Costco's and Walmarts and stuff like that. So, um, but I... This, we're still in the middle of this, and we still have to navigate. And when you navigate a problem, you know they say about the great battle plans? Plan, 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 but once you start the battle, throw it out. We're in the middle of the battle. You and I can argue about a lot of different things, but we should keep on trying different things, trying to get better. You know, we're, like I said, we're resilient people. It will show through. We will win. We just want to do it sooner rather than later and minimize the damage. Why do you feel so confident? Because I just keep thinking about the 30 million people that don't have jobs right now or who are being forced to go back to work and they don't have child care or health care. If we don't provide health care to every working American, how can they feel safe to go work? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, but, but I can't answer that one question. But remember, everyone gets health care who goes to a hospital. So you do get health care. You can get tested. You get a bunch of different things. But, but I agree. We, we, I am quite upset at society because the things you mentioned, we have failed at fixing for 30 years. COVID just made it look worse. Health care has been a problem for 30 years. We spend twice as much as other countries. There are 40 million people uninsured. The outcomes, we have unbelievable doctors. You know, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of that. Unbelievable hospitals and medical and pharma and devices, but twice as much, and we don't have twice as good outcome. We don't teach nutrition and wellness in high school, and we should. You know, there's so many basic things that we don't do as a society that would have made this much better. So, you know, you got to separate the short run from the long run. America's resiliency is astounding. And if you don't believe me, go back and look at, you know, someone wrote a great article about someone who lived through the Spanish, World War I, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, World War II, and the country did fine and recovered from all of them. Well, the, then given right. how well you know the financial system, big business, small business, consumers, you have a lot of influence over the government. You're a, a big part of the business roundtable. As Congress is determining the next economic relief package, what do you think they need to do most? Yeah, I don't think we have that much influence. And you know, remember, the, the folks in Congress speak to everybody. They've got a lot of different groups they speak to. Uh, they're trying to figure out the right thing. But I do think there'll be unemployment insurance extended. They should just split the difference. I mean, just move on, $300 or $400. There should be PPP some kind of extension, particularly focused on 
the folks who need kind of the restart money or some, or the ones who didn't get it the first go around because a lot of news outlets are saying that you know minority businesses got much less than they actually needed. Uh, you know, Main Street lending is there as a backstop for certain things. Uh, so, and then big, big business should hang on. I mean, I would tell my fellow brother, let's hang on, let's keep on going because you don't want to start the vicious cycle of people saying, oh, you cut back this, and then you cut back that, and then they cut back advertising, and then they cut back. And that's, that's the stuff that, you know, recessions are made of. So we're in a funny recession now. You see, we have this high unemployment, but you don't see it in home prices, delinquencies, charge-offs, people's balance sheets, none of that. And so... Uh, then how do you read this time? Do you, would you say we're in a recession while yeah. houses are... Yes? We're, we're, we're in a recession, but you, you're going to have a delayed effect of seeing the normal effects of recession. That may not really happen until late this year or early next year. But it will eventually affect incomes. It hasn't yet because the government largesse. Uh, home prices, well, it will when people you know, realize they may not have a job. So, yeah, you're going to see some of the effects of that. You're sort of the definition of big business. You have a global footprint. When you see the president making executive orders that impact the business we do, specifically with companies in China, how concerned does that make you? You know, you have to separate. There are legitimate traders with China, legitimate securities with China, uh, and you know, I'm going to let the administration worry about that. You know, we read about it, but I don't necessarily know more than you would know about it. Uh, that does not mean you can't do a trade deal. It does not mean you can't have a, a good part of the relationship. You know, so to me, China has a serious amount of problems. I mean, the American public hears only about China that can overtake America. In 30 years, they will still have one-third of our GDP per person. They have huge corruption. They have a very complex country. They don't have enough food, enough water, enough energy. I'm saying this respectfully. So if you do an assessment of China, do a fair assessment. And so, you know, America, look at us. We have all the food, war, and energy we need. We have the wise and deepest we capital. We do not have all the food we need. Yes, We've got we, 29 million uh, food insecure Americans. No, no, no that's, that's because of inequality. That's not because we don't have Nebraska. You know, we've got the beef and the food and the milk and the, we have the energy. We've got, we've got wonderful neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We have not had a border skirmish with our neighbors since 1848. You see, China's had several since World War II with Russia, India, Pakistan. I mean, they have, they're a very complex part of the world. We have the great gifts that were given to us. And I actually look at most of the problems we have as created by us. They weren't created by immigration. That's been a huge plus for America. They weren't created by trade. Yes, there were negatives. I think there are a lot of legitimate complaints that trade, some trade didn't favor Americans properly. I think that's probably true and fixable, and I think the administration's been trying to fix that. Um, they weren't caused by the Chinese. You're giving right. the administration a lot of credit. Do you believe they're handling the COVID crisis well? What grade would you give them? I'm not going to grade the administration on that. I, I don't know. I mean, I'll let you guys, that's your job. My job is to do a great job at J.P. Morgan as best I can for the country. So. Uh, I do want to ask just before we go, because you mentioned it a little bit earlier, about productivity loss yeah. while we're all home, yeah. especially as it relates to students not getting to go to school or young people not getting to thrive or network in the workplace. How right. concerned are you about that? Not immediately yet. Okay, so it's amazing that all these companies, not just JP Morgan, were able to get 150,000 people working from home with kits and computers and Zooms and, and all these various things and stuff like that. And we, we're still having a hot debate in my own management team. Some say productivity is just as good. I, I always question. I'm a little bit of a skeptic on that. But I think there are some jobs we know it's as good. We can actually measure it. There are other jobs we can't. But I personally think there are, there are several things you lose. One of the things you lose is, and maybe the most important, is just creative combustion that comes from just walking around, talking to people, accidental conversations or sharing of information. Steve Jobs used to talk about that. And I think you, you lose that. You definitely lose mentoring the younger kids. The younger kids don't learn because you give them something to read or you lecture them. They learn because they're on the sales call with you, to sit in the trading desk, and you say, no, that's not the way you should do that, you know, or talk to a lawyer about that. They learn, they're constantly learning from dealing with more senior people and stuff like that. Uh, and I also think you lose a little bit of the EQ you get from being in a room with someone. So Zoom kind of works. The other thing is, and you don't get rapid follow-up. So in Zoom, it's like, okay, I'll talk to you and I'll set something up. I'll call you later. It's not the same thing as you and I meet. And then I have three ideas. I walk down to your office and say, by the way, Stephanie, I disagree on those two, but I agree on that one. Why don't you read X? So there's constant feedback and a constant education loop. You kind of lose that a little bit too. Yeah. So, I, so I agree with you. What I personally think is going to see 
productivity and creativity come down and that people want to separate their lives, work from home and work, where you actually go to work, uh, and that all of us, and that there may be certain jobs that are permanent work from home, but I'm a skeptic that it's going to be like 50%. What about right? as a student? Think about when you went to college. Yeah. Suddenly all that you were exposed to, and it changed your goals in life. Of course. No, that you, students, how can they, you can learn some stuff online, but the stuff by being in the room with people and having a social life, I always call uh, college camp without counselors, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you learn how to take care of yourself, you know, that you have to wake up, not, mo not mommy and daddy are going to wake you up in the morning, that you've got to learn to go to the library and have a discipline. You know, it's not your mom and dad telling you study for an hour or something like that. So Then if you were uh, in yeah. charge with the number one place to put COVID resources to be to make schools safe? Oh, I, I look, it's going to be all about testing and making every place safe. And, you know, the schools, and I know some schools have put up the plastic barriers and Kids don't carry it as much. And remember, 80, what is 85% of the deaths are nursing homes and people over 70 years old or something like that. So there are, and, you, we, and I, I have not studied deeply what other countries are doing, but other countries are going back to work. Their death rates are low. They've opened up. And when, you know, when it flares up, you cut back a little bit. So it's, you know, it's kind of balancing it. But you don't have to like open and close totally like some of these parts of the world did. So. Before we go, I know you have so much on your plate, uh, but you also have to be somewhat thinking about the election. The president says, you like these markets? You like how well the economy is doing? It's all going to go down the toilet without me. I'm not going to comment on politics. Uh, I would say that whatever happens, we're going to run J.P. Morgan and do a great job serving our clients. Democrats, Republicans, it makes no difference to me. We do a great job serving our clients, and we have to deal with whoever our regulators are and stuff like that. We're going to satisfy regulators. We're going to do a great job serving the clients and hopefully a great job serving our country. And so uh, um, I, hope who, I hope whoever's president realizes that we need to fix these policy things, and that's good for all Americans. A more rapidly growing America will create the wherewithal to have better safety nets, better schools, better jobs, better infrastructure. And so you, need, you should have a growth agenda. You know, it's, not a bad, it's a good idea to have a growth agenda. And it's a bad idea not to recognize our own self-inflicted problems. You care an awful lot about policy. We've been talking more about policy than, than J.P. Morgan P&L. Does that mean you could see yourself as a member of an administration, uh, maybe a I, Treasury Secretary? I love what I do, and I don't think I'm suited to politics. All right. Thank you for your time. Stephanie, thank you.